Welcome. This is Money Heart, where we explore the emotional side of money. I'm Camille Diaz, and today we're discussing Big Fish, Small Pond. My guest is Rick Ballinger. He's the owner of Runner's Licensing. Rick, welcome to Money Heart. Thank you. Before we get into this concept of Big Fish and Small Pond, it might kind of make sense for us to go back to your early career. Would you share that story with us? Sure. Um, I guess uh, Starts graduated from uh, LSU uh, for football fans. Great year last year. Not off to a good start this year. <laughs> um, uh, graduated LSU in 75, went to work for Olin Corporation, a chemical company, uh, mm -hmm. making stuff that you, you don't ever want to see, bad chemicals that'll hurt you if you see them. Um, started with them in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Um, moved um, from Baton Rouge, by the way, so that was a short, uh, short trip. Uh, then went to work with, the, uh, with them. They moved me to a plant in uh, East Tennessee, right outside of Chattanooga. Uh, again, making bad stuff, but different bad stuff. Um, as, an, as an engineer, I was kind of uh, an industrial engineer. I was involved in the manpower side of it, not the actual chemical side of it. So I didn't get involved with that stuff too much anyway. And then I uh, became a maintenance superintendent for the same company in Niagara Falls, New York. I lived there for about three years. Um, uh, moved up there right around uh, 79, 80, and left them in 1982 um, to join Anheuser-Busch in St. Louis, Missouri, uh, working for a guy that I had actually worked with when I first got out of school in Lake Charles, so it was kind of a reconnection, if you will, um, and became the general manager of the Anheuser-Busch distributorship here in Tulsa after working in St. Louis in a kind of administrative operations position for for three years uh, and was general manager of the Anheuser-Busch distributorship here for uh, about eight years. Uh, called myself the beer baron of Tulsa. Uh, and then um, Anheuser-Busch wanted to move me back to St. Louis, uh, various reasons. Um, and um, that's where we'll get into the big fish small pond because I was actually working in St. Louis doing some uh, uh, work that they wanted me to do for a while, and that's where that uh, that concept came up, and I ultimately uh, elected to leave Anheuser-Busch, and as they say, go out and seek my fortune. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, when was that moment that you knew you didn't want to be the tiny fish in the huge pond? And, and you know, I'm, I'm an engineer. I'm an engineer, engineer by degree, and we're supposed to be the fact people. You know, you learn all that mathematics and logical thinking and all that, so it's all supposed to be logic. But as I mentioned, um, I had uh, been working in St. Louis for, for a while back again uh, on some projects they wanted me to work on. And um, there were two things that, that kind of popped into mind. And uh, one of them was, was the logical side. Um, having been uh, here in Tulsa as the general manager for the beer distributorship, I got to know a lot of people. Of course, if you're the guy that has all the beer, everybody, you know. Oh, people become you. your friend, yeah. They, they want you to be at their party and all that. So I got to know a lot of people, and I got to thinking that if I moved back to St. Louis, I didn't know anybody. Mm. Um, and, and even worse than that, this is hard for people to imagine, but this was a time in, in um, the beverage business when bottled water was brand new. And Anheuser-Busch was dabbling in bottled water. They were dabbling in seltzer products. And some people may remember Eagle Snacks, a great line of snacks that they had, but it didn't last very long. Their honey roast peanuts were just incredible. But anyway, the point of that is when they dabbled in something like that and it didn't work, the people that moved over from the beer side and went to work, say, on the beverage side, if that beverage business didn't work and, and Anheuser-Busch uh, either divested of it or uh, shut it down, they lost their job. And I could see myself in St. Louis, not knowing anybody and being on the outside, all of a sudden, not without a job uh, in, a, in a town where I, I didn't, uh, didn't know anybody. And I figured the logical side said, it's better for me to say no to Anheuser-Busch for the move to St. Louis and stay in Tulsa where I know everybody and can network that into either a business or a job or whatever. And that is ultimately what I did. And we can talk a little bit about that in a bit. But the big fish, small pond, I was sitting at a desk 
um, up in, in St. Louis, and um, a couple of guys around me. I was at just a desk in a little office, and I knew the guys on either side of me. I'd known them since I went to work there in 82. This is about 93, 94. Okay. Um, and um, good guys. I liked them. But, you know, I got to, I just, I felt there's like 10,000, 20,000 people. I don't know how many there are at the Anheuser-Busch Brewery and, and the headquarters office there in St. Louis. And in Tulsa, we had, I don't know, 50, 100 people. I don't remember exactly how many people we had working the distributorship here, but I was the top dog. I was, as you just said, the big fish. It was, it was a small pond, but I was the biggest fish in that small pond. And I just looked around me and I said, I'm going to be one of 10,000, 20,000 people up here. Yeah. I just can't do it. Yeah. And that was an emotional moment. You know, with us engineers are not supposed to have those. <laughs> But aside from that logical, I don't want to be stuck in St. Louis without a job. Mm -hmm. There was that, I, I just can't be a little bitty fish in this great big pond. Mm -hmm. And that was just that aha moment that said, nope, nope. I'm going to stay in Tulsa and go out in the world and seek my fortune. Yeah. yeah. Here we are. Here we are. Here we are. And I love that point that you made about networking and figuring that if you knew people and you and you had relationships with them you could make that work for whatever it was you decided to do and you know i i kind of started doing some consulting work and and uh some of the stuff that i had read said that, that some people do consulting work with the goal of ultimately going to work for one of the people that they're consulting with and that's exactly what happened to me and there are two things happened um my wife and i started runner's licensing um about that time, uh, shortly after I left Anheuser-Busch. And, um, but if you've ever started a business, you know the struggle when you first get started, you just don't have any clients, you gotta make things happen and you're living off whatever savings you've got and eating into that savings for a bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, you also don't have health insurance and, and, sure. and getting health insurance on your own, even though that marketplace has changed somewhat, it's still a challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, so I actually, was doing some consulting work for Standard Distributing out in Sepulpa. They're a convenience store supplier that sells just everything you can buy in a convenience store. Yeah. I was doing some consulting work for them and sitting in the office of the boss one day, and he was talking to him about some project we're working on, and he was struggling with something, and he just said, man, I need a sales manager. And about that time, the rest of my consulting business, which was with Anheuser-Busch Distributors, another story, was kind of uh, dropping off, and I said, Jimmy, I need a job. So he needed a sales manager, I needed a job, and we put that together, and, and I worked for, for Standard Distributing for about 15 years, and I just retired from that. My wife and son ran uh, runner's licensing for those 15 years and actually built it into a, a, a much bigger business. Uh, and then when I retired from, uh, from Standard Distributing, I kind of got back into the business, helped market it, do some paperwork, and um, uh, some of the running down to Oklahoma City or to City Hall or, or whatever. So I'm back into it uh, more than I was for 15 years. Wow. I, like it. I know that um, there's been some changes to the alcohol laws in this state recently. Uh, I guess kind of fill us in a little bit more about what you do right. in your business and then how did those changes a couple years ago have an effect on you? And, and that's, that's an interesting point. You and I talked about that before. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people have talked over the last, um, well, since this pandemic or apocalypse, as I sometimes call it, started back in uh, March time frame, that it, they've had to pivot their business. Yes. We were pivoting starting back almost exactly two years ago in October of, of 2018 when the liquor law changed. Mm -hmm. Because when we started Runners um, back in 93, 94, um, our primary focus was on 3-2 beer permits. And in, on the 3-2 beer side of the business, and, and people don't know this, and we, we could get into a whole other discussion about that. There's the strong beer, the, the liquor and wine side, which was one side of the business, and the 3-2 beer side, which is another. But the 3-2 beer permit um, started with the county, and it, you, you had to go to the county courthouse. You had to file the paperwork in person. You had to then put a posting notice on the, your proposed place of business where your neighbors could complain if they wanted to or, or you know, nothing, nothing usually happened. But then after leaving that posting up 
in the window or door for two weeks, you had to go back to the county courthouse and pick up your paperwork. And then you could go to the tax commission for your sales tax permit and, and tobacco permits if you needed it and their alcohol permit, mm -hmm. um, et cetera. And then go to city hall and get their, their permits. But it all started with the county. Well, three, two beer went away when the law changed and everybody now, um, Supermarkets, grocery stores, convenience stores can sell strong beer and wine, which they couldn't do before. Um, that, those products can be sold cold. Liquor products can be sold cold. You know, all of that just changed. And even though we had a pretty good liquor license business going, that 3-2 beer business just went away overnight. Mm. And not only did we lose the billable hours that we could bill going down to the courthouse twice, Right. Um, we lost some clients and <clears throat> had to pick up new clients um, that were getting away from 3-2 beer, going into strong beer and whatever. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> people talk about pivoting. The pandemic had very, very little effect on us. We were already having to re, some people would call it rebranding. Mm -hmm. I would say more changing our marketing. I, I started networking more. And we both said the word networking quite a bit. Right. And, um, I started talking more to commercial realtors and property managers, the people that know when something new is coming into town. Mm. Uh, I joined some of the smaller chambers around Tulsa, mm -hmm. Broken Arrow, Bigsby, Jinx, mm -hmm. to try and get into those towns where a lot of growth is happening. Right. Broken Arrow with the Rose District. Jinx uh, uh, has broken ground on a new um, outlet mall that kind of on yep. and off again with the pandemic, but it'll mm -hmm. happen eventually. And we want to know what's going on with all the businesses around that. Right. So we changed the way we're networking um, and just had to, everybody keeps using that word pivot. We were pivoting for two years ago and, and kind of still are. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's the story. Right. Now you kind of expanded your services as well. If I'm remembering correctly, you're not just doing the, the liquor licensing anymore. You're now, anytime somebody needs to stand in line at the courthouse or whatever, <laughs> they can pretty much hire you to do it. Is that accurate? That's correct. Um, we um, we had already, uh, over the last years and years, gotten more into that liquor side as opposed to the three two beer side because bars and restaurants became kind of our bread and butter. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of hard to have a bar or restaurant that doesn't serve a mixed drink or, or a glass of wine. Right. Uh, but yes, uh, the state legalized um, uh, medical marijuana mm -hmm. a while back, and you, you need a lot of permits for that. You know, anytime one of those heavily regulated, some people call them the sin industries. Uh, the state loves to, to, to control those and um, require a lot of permits and regulate and all that. So we've gotten into the marijuana business a little bit. It's, it's kind of hard. That's pretty easy to do online. And online has is, is hurt us in a number of different places. Mm -hmm. Although we still offer that expertise, kind of like your tax accountant. Right. You, you your taxes, if you'd like, but you don't want to stay up on the laws. You don't want to keep up with every bit of paperwork. I really don't. <laughs> no, nobody, particularly if you own a business and you got all the extra forms that go with, with a business. Right. So that's kind of the expertise that we feel for any kind of permit is we know the paperwork. We're, we're, we're both notaries. Uh, we can notarize your signature. We, we, we know where to go. You, you don't have to research which desk do I go to at, at ABLE. Oh, or, gosh. That saves hours. <laughs> that saves hours, exactly right. <laughs> yeah. We still offer that expertise. Uh, we've offered to um, uh, attorneys. Uh, we, we're always going downtown. If you've got some paperwork that needs to go down there, we'll be glad to, to, right. to take it. Uh, kind of just kicking that off and hadn't, hadn't started doing much of that yet. But we have gotten some of the marijuana stuff, so we branched into that. And, mm -hmm. um, I, like your, I like your concept of making sure that business owners are working on their business. Yes. And, you know, one thing that, that my son reminds me of, and he's, he's the one that does all the actual paperwork. Um, he's, he's much better at that than I am. Um, <clears throat> all too often, we get involved with somebody after they've started because they're getting frustrated. Mm -hmm. And it, er, almost everybody needs a sales tax permit. If you're going to sell something, um, you need to have a sales tax permit from the tax commission. You, you, right. you may need a, a tobacco permit or an alcohol permit from them as well, depending on what you're doing. Everybody needs that sales tax permit. Mm -hmm. And all too often, people have filled the paperwork out wrong. And yeah. they've got started and then have to start all over again because you didn't do your address quite right. Or you had your address listed over here as suite A and you didn't bother to put suite A on this piece of paper. 
So right. the, the, they don't match, or you just did something wrong. <clears throat> and one thing we tell people is, we'll guarantee that your sales tax permit paperwork is done right the first time, so you don't have to start all over again. Delay your opening, potentially, because yes. you don't have a sales permit to open. So, yes, right. we provide that expertise that, that um, <clears throat> shortens the process a bit and keeps you so you can do your business. Mm -hmm. If you're starting up a new restaurant, you got to buy all your furniture and fixtures. You got to hire your staff. You got to do all your build out with your architects and, and construction people. Uh, so we, we take all the government stuff away from you while you can concentrate on that. Right. Right. And it's a, such a, such a good thing for business owners to be reminded of is to, you know, like you just said, you have your construction people. So you hire the construction people to do construction. You hire paperwork people to do paperwork. You hire a tax person to do taxes. You hire, you know, you hire people to do the other things that you're not the expert in so that you can make sure you're actually spending as much time as possible running your business and providing the service that you provide. So I think that's great information. We have to be notaries for, for, for what we do. And there's a, there are a number of services and we use one that reminds us when our, our notary seal is due to be renewed. Mm -hmm. We use them. I don't want to do all that. I got to get a new seal <laughs> with all your stamp with a new, new uh, date on it. You got to file this paperwork. I pay somebody, I, I write them a check, send them some information. And a few weeks later, my new seal comes in, my new uh, notary, or whatever you call it, yep. comes in. I hire people to do the thing. I hire a tax, just like you said, people hire you to take care of financial stuff that, that yep. uh, you do a lot better than them. You're exactly right. That's, a, that's what we, the service we provide. We're just a little bit unique because we're targeted at just people that are in the sin industry. <laughs> the sin industry target. That's right. Yes. But yeah, so true. I literally told my attorney, I never want to have to think about this again. Can you just make sure it happens when it's supposed to happen? And she yep. said, yes, that's what we do. I said, fabulous. <laughs> because I don't want to remember that my kind of that thing and I have to send it in. I don't, I don't want to be in charge of that. You be in charge yep. of that. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so very happy those. to pay for a service that, that just handles it. <laughs> So yep. I love that. I love that. Uh, when we talked initially, you shared a little bit of your story of, um, and it included some investment advice, which I thought was really uh, useful. And I was wondering if you'd be willing to share that with us as well. Um, when when uh, we were living in Tennessee, um, so that puts it at uh, 78, 79, mm -hmm. um, about the time I accepted the job to move to uh, Niagara Falls as a maintenance superintendent for the same company I was working for, our daughter was born. I mean, we literally moved when she was five weeks old. Wow. Our, our son, that would peg him at about three years old. Mm -hmm. um, after we moved to Niagara Falls, um, I decided that I wanted to start investing. You know, I, I, you know for whatever reason, you know, you, you got to have some money put away if you ever want to retire. Social Security's not going to do it. Maybe a 401k is part of that mm -hmm. or, or whatever uh, your, your employer might offer. But um, I kind of decided that I wanted to, to start investing in the stock market. And, and keep in mind, at this point, my daughter's maybe by this time a year old. Yeah. My son's four, you know, somewhere in there. This is, this is around, I'm 30. I'm about 30 years old, somewhere in there. And I, I, I somehow pulled together $500 and I went down to um, an investment firm in, in Buffalo, which was just a little, little bit away from Niagara Falls area where we we're living. Mm -hmm. And I put $500 into, I'm going to say a, a mutual fund. Sure. You know, I don't even remember. And I think within a year or so, I had another $500 scraped together. So, you know, I was a big time investor. I That's right. In the stock market. But, you know, the point of that is people say, well, I just can't do that right now. You know, I got this going on. I got this going on. Well, you know, I had an infant daughter and a toddler son. My wife was um, a stay-at-home mom, um, fortunately. Um, so I was the only one working. And, you know, part of that is if, if I could find $500, and, you know, you don't have to invest $10,000. You don't have to invest $20,000 if you get in the habit of doing it. Even if it's a couple of bucks here and there, some of my friends have said, if you, if you, if you can put 200 bucks a month aside, you'll be a millionaire by the time you retire or more than a millionaire. Yes, and, and maybe you've had to be 200. I, I don't know. But if I can do that when I've got little bitty kids and my wife not working, you can find a couple of hundred dollars to, to do something with it and at least get in the habit of putting money aside. Don't depend upon yeah, social security. It's, it's part of the, 
part of your, your investment strategy and, you know, your 401k or whatever at work is part of it, but you need to be doing something on your own. And if I can do it, then you can do it. Thank you. That's wonderful. I, I feel like that message is missed so often. We think that something else is going to take care of it for us. Um, yeah. you know, well, I'm working. So my 401k will be there. Or like you said, social security will handle it. And it, it's part of the strategy, but not the whole strategy. We have to be responsible for ourselves. And you're so, so right about the habit. The habit of saving makes a way bigger difference than the amount. You don't have to put in twenty, fifty thousand $50,000 at a time a couple hundred dollars a month will actually make you a millionaire by retirement if you can do it consistently for your entire yeah. working career. It really will do it. So, yeah. And, you know, and, and I know that life gets in the way and sometimes you, you can't keep it up. But if you've established that habit, if for a while you have to back off of that regular, you've got that mindset that I'm going to get back to it. And, and you just, you just got to start doing it and do it. Mm -hmm. No doubt. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for all of your insights today. This has been great. Well, I hope it's a good story. It, 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 it's a story. <laughs> <laughs> it's a story. It was a fun story. Thank you very much. If you would like to get in touch with Rick or Runner's Licensing, you can send him an email to rick at runnerslicensing.com. Thank you as well to all of our listeners and viewers. I'm your host, Camille Diaz. This show is sponsored by Serenity Financial, a five rings financial agency specializing in financial education life insurance with living benefits, and guaranteed lifetime income. Be sure to follow Money Heart on social media at Money Heart Show and on our website, moneyheartshow.com. Today's money mantra is, even if I start small, I start. Thanks again, Rick. I appreciate it. Thanks, Camille.